The stock market in July, the U.S. stock market in particular, just completed its fifth consecutive monthly gain. I mean, stocks are moving up as if by levitation at this point. Recession, banking crisis, what are those? This is more like a melt-up, I think. I'm not really sure because I don't pay all that much attention to the stock market since it doesn't really have a whole lot of information, not any information that I'm interested in anyway. But a lot of people do get their information about a lot of things from share prices. So I thought this was an interesting article in Bloomberg yesterday. Uh, they tell us about Scott Rubner, who's a managing director at Goldman Sachs, who the article says has studied flow of funds for two decades. And he's telling his clients that they need to either reload on their shorts or put on downside hedges. And the reason, quote, I am so bullish that I am actually bearish now for August. I am looking for a smallish equity correction in August. My core behavioral view is that I no longer speak to any macro bears. Positioning and sentiment is no longer pessimistic. It is euphoric. And why is it euphoric? And I think that's an accurate assessment, but why is it euphoric? And the answer is the Fed. Because most often the information you get from share prices in very general broad terms is that the markets parrot whatever the Fed is doing and thinking. So if you think the Fed is thinking that rate hikes are coming to an end and you believe that rate hikes are a big part of the pain in the equity prices over the last year or so, yet almost two years now, and rate hikes are coming to the end at the same time the Fed is saying, you know, we don't even see a recession anymore. We see a complete soft landing. No wonder everybody's euphoric in stocks because the Fed is saying we're getting close to the end of rate hikes at the same time we're going to achieve a soft landing. It is absolutely Goldilocks. But as I mentioned a couple days ago in a video, Goldilocks was a convicted criminal of sorts. So you got to be careful about Goldilocks, which gets us thinking, what would spoil the euphoria in stocks? What would cause a general awakening to maybe the situation being somewhat different than Goldilocks would have you think. Um, a banking crisis would be one thing, a reflaring of the crisis. Um, not many people noticed that we had a couple of bank mergers fly under the radar there just recently. The big one though, the recession, because stocks do not do well during recessionary periods. So we have to ask what would cause a widespread recognition that there is a recession going on in the economy? And the answer, the most, the most blaring, blatant, obvious answer is the labor market, which brings us to the data we got today. A couple, couple reports, but let's start with this quote from the ISM. Demand remains weak, but marginally better compared to June. Production slowed due to lack of work and suppliers continue to have capacity. There are signs of more employment reduction actions in the near term to better match production output. As I mentioned yesterday, more and more realizing the second half rebound isn't there. And as they realize there is no second half rebound, they have to start doing something more drastic about their situation, which ISM just said remains weak. It's a lot more than weak. So we've got a lot of labor market data that suggests we're getting to the point where the recession becomes more and more obvious, which could then maybe spoil the euphoria on Wall Street. But first, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, normally in this, this, this part of the video, I plug my research subscriptions and memberships, but today I want to talk to you about something different. The Acid Capitalist Macro Retreat. And Acid Capitalist, you notice that's having an exclusive three-day three event hosted by Mr. Henry. Maison Blanc Blue Saint Mark, and it features Spencer Henry, Gammon, Brent Johnson, and so we're going to have some discussions about all these interesting things in the macro and monetary world. It's as the tagline says: no PowerPoint, no students, no bull. Don't believe it at all here on YouTube. But either way, I'm looking forward to this. And if you're interested in joining me, Brent and George. Program. I'll leave a link in the description below. And just so you know, I'm not being paid for this. This is just something fun that I am looking forward to. Just to talk about all the things that we talk about here on YouTube, but do it in an 
an absolutely idyllic setting. And they're pretty Again, check out the link below if you're interested in joining us in St. Bart's later on this month. Labor market. That's what's going to lead to everybody saying, oh, we thought soft landing, but now we see it's a little bit worse than that. Now we get into deflationary recession when consumer prices start following their producer prices, but in the labor market, which is what everybody follows because that's all you hear about. Jay Powell or whatever expert in, on, in Bloomberg or across the financial media, they're always pointing to the unemployment rate or the payroll report, which we'll get on Friday. We have some preliminary data, not just from the ISM, but also from the BLS, this time in terms of jolts, which suggests the labor market is under strain and is beginning to crack too. The jolts data primarily is job openings. That's the one most people watch. That's not the one I think you should watch, but even that one, which is obviously overstating the, lake, the, the, the strength and conditions in the labor market and has been for years, but either way, job openings, which is usually a favorite of the Federal Reserve's, various policymakers have said uh, they follow the job openings number very closely. Is a, it's supposed to be a measure of demand for work. If you're if you're looking to hire someone, you're, you're likely going to post the. An, an, it used to be an ad in, in the newspaper. Now you're posting ads online, and the government attempts to to keep track of those postings as a measure of labor demand. That's I've been overstated for years, as I said. But if the most optimistic take on the on labor demand suddenly starts to go down, or not even suddenly, just starts to go weaker and weaker and weaker, lower and lower and lower, even if that number is still incredibly huge, you can at least say, well, even this one is picking up the downturn. So it's very likely that there is a downturn for it to be picking up. And that's what we see in Jolt's job openings. For the month of June, this goes back to June, there's they're, they're a month in arrears here. For the month of June, job openings, they dropped to 9.58 million. That's the lowest since April 2021. So still a high level, but we're moving downward again. Um, that's down from a revised 9.62 million in uh, May, which was revised from 9.82 million. So a substantial downward revision to May plus lower in June. We're getting down to nine and a half million. So the supply shock, quote unquote, labor shortage, round tripping that part too. And as we've been saying all along, the labor market, the labor situation is always lagging. It's the last one that falls into the recession category because companies don't want to part with their workers. They want to continue on as if everything is going. That's the second half rebound hope. They want to continue and hoard workers until the last possible moment. And this year, more than any other year, we've seen evidence and anecdotes that suggest and indicate that companies are hoarding workers at a, at a pace or at a level that we've not seen maybe ever, and certainly not in our recent, not in recent memory or maybe in our lifetimes. To me, the big number, the number from Jolts is hiring. The rates of, the, the rate of monthly actual hiring that companies do not what they're advertising. It's easy to throw an ad, ad up on Craigslist or whatever people use, indeed.com or whatever whatever people use nowadays. It's really easy to throw up an ad, but it's, it's much more difficult to complete the hiring process. What we see in hires in June of 2023, according to the BLS, that fell to 5.905. So 5.91 million in the month of June, which is the least since February 2021. That's down from 6.231 million in the month of May. So hires have fallen below 6 million and down to 5.9 million for the first time in over two years. So again, the labor market is rolling over and it's actually, you know, according, when you line up um, the jolts numbers with the monthly payroll report, which you can do with a few you know, calculations in between, what you see is that the last payroll report for June, maybe the rate of hires was even worse than this 5.9 million indicates because that leaves the that leaves us off by about 100,000 or so. Um, so by going by the payroll number for June, it looks like we should have we should have had only 5.8 million hires in June or maybe there were more layoffs or quits, some form of discharge in the workforce because 
Even with the numbers we have from Jolts, they say quits fell to 3.77 million in June. That's down from 4.1 million in May, and it had been 3.77 million in April. So quits are at a lower level too. The entire Jolts survey is saying the labor market is slowing down, which Jay Powell would say, yes, we know the labor market is slowing down, but we think it's going to stop slowing down. But is it going to stop slowing down? That's really the question we keep coming back to. Because if we're moving in, we're moving from an economy that was marginally in expansion before, and it's slowing down, it's going to look like it's going to slow down. And then, then what happens? Economy that falls into recession is going to look like it's slowing down before it actually hits, to, hits recession. That's why we look at these forward indications from things like the ISM survey, which we'll go over in a minute. But what is undeniable at this point, which many people tried to deny earlier in the year, maybe it's not priced in the stock market, is that the economy is slowing down and the labor market, which is exceptionally lagging, it's among the last things that turn and roll over, it is now clearly in that same situation too. We're seeing the pattern of the everything decelerating, including prices. Even if it hasn't hit the unemployment rate yet, though we'll see on Friday if it does, it hasn't hit the unemployment rate yet, but it's happening nonetheless. So let's go, I mentioned the ISM at the beginning here. So let's go to the ISM numbers because their employment figure well, it lines up with everything else that they're telling us. First of all, the, the index, the PMI, 46.4 for the month of July. That's up a touch, a fraction from the 46.0 in June. New orders improved, which means they didn't really improve. They just, the number went up. It's 47.3, which is not an improvement from 45.6 in June. It's just fewer contraction or a slower contraction. Still contracting, that's the big part. Uh, new export orders. We talk about this all the time. Global trade recession. The ISM, new export orders, 46.2 compared to 47.3 in June. So foreign sales continue to decline. And it's funny how, de depending on the perspective, whether it's the U.S. perspective or Chinese perspective, European perspective, it's always somebody else who's weakening. It's always a global trade recession rather than our own problem. We can always say, hey, it's not the US, it's not China, it's not Europe, it's, it's a global trade recession. But that's consistently what we see across the economic data. So if the employment condition and the employment data is exceptionally lagging, it's the global trade recession that is way out in front. That's what we saw, that's where we saw the weakness develop for the, at the first part. That's where we saw a lot of indications of trouble ahead, and it's only continued to develop further and further and further, as the ISM is telling us, to the point that the U.S. economy is being dragged into the same global recessionary vortex that a lot of places around the world are already very evidently struggling with, including starting with China more than anyone else. Prices from the ISM, the price index was just 42.6. That's up fractionally from 41.8 in June. So again, deflationary producer prices, production, weak demand, all that good stuff. It's good in terms of price pressures, not good because of why that is. And the backlog number, that's something we've been talking about a lot more too. That one improved in July from the ISM, but again, the word improved doesn't really apply here. It went up from from 38.7 in June to 42.8 in July, which means backlogs. Companies are still working through their backlogs because they don't have enough new orders coming in, which means at some point, and that point might be June and July, they have to start making decisions about their workers. They don't have enough work. No new sales coming in. Backlogs are being worked through. At some point, you gotta say enough is enough. Either you hold on to workers and continue to hoard them, or you look at the second half rebound as a very distant probability and begin laying off workers. And that's exactly what the ISM numbers show. Uh, the employment index tumbled to 44.0 in July, which is the lowest since June of 2020. And I, always meant, I already mentioned, it's worth reiterating here, 
The ISM statement, there are signs of more employment reduction actions in the near term to better match production output. Again, with no, no new sales coming in, backlogs diminished, it's, the labor market is going to start bearing the brunt of the recession. It's coming along with everything else. And some of the comments here, and this is, I'll just read you the first four comments from the ISM. Not of them, the last one was okay, but I mean, you, can, you get a good sense of what these companies are, say, are seeing in the real economy here. Current U.S. market conditions of inflationary, recessionary tactics affecting overall business. Customers are reducing or not placing orders as forecast, putting internal focus on reducing financial liabilities and overhead costs. That also gets into lending and credit, which you can't get into here today. Next comment. Sales in our industry are extremely slow entering the second half of the year. Not good for the second half rebound. And no upturn is expected until at least the fourth quarter. So now it's not a second half rebound. It's a fourth quarter rebound as it keeps getting pushed further and further into the future. The next comment. Demand is softening. Some pricing starting to decrease. Back orders mostly revolved. Again, the worst case scenario for producers. Got no work left to do. Deflationary pricing just to try to maintain some business. And it's not working. And just one last comment here. Stable demand for the next four to six months, but longer term uncertainty. This is the best case. While customer growth is projected, we cannot point to fundamentals that sustain it. Supply conditions are similar to pre-pandemic, except for energy and raw input costs. Logistic costs have settled. Transit times continue to shorten. And capacities at most suppliers are sufficient. We've round-tripped the supply shock. The supply condition back to normal, but... Demand is not. We have to adjust for the last couple years of massive imbalances in the global macro economy. It's taking a while to, for it to get into the U.S. labor market. We saw it first, as I just said, global trade recession that continues to develop and continues to worsen. And we're now beginning to see it really impact the labor market too. The labor market in the U.S. as well as other places around the world. Just one final note, we got the Shaixin PMI from China last night. That one was incredibly weak, 49.2 from 50.5. And notably, employment in that index was below 50 for the fifth consecutive month as well. And they mentioned backlogs, lack of sales, and everything else. It's a globally synchronized trade recession, and maybe much worse than that if the employment statistics reflect a real legitimate slowdown and even a potentially contraction in employment here and around the rest of the world. To bring this back to the beginning, what would spoil the stock market euphoria? If this stuff continues in the direction it's likely to continue in where everything else is already going, that would certainly do it. If you wanna see more videos about struggles in employment and what that means and where it's going, check out the video that's sitting right underneath me right now. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you to Eurodollar University subscribers and members. And until next time, everyone take care.